So, uh, 8th of July, 2023, Jim Fitz has just had his double bypass, and he's trying to show it, but I think, um, I'm not so sure I want to see the scar. <laughs> I'll just show you a little tip, tip of it, Greg. It's eight and a half inches. Oh, okay. Whoa. Actually, that looks very clean compared to what has been in the past because I just saw my physician yesterday. And they put glue on top and they took off a lot of the glue, okay? I mean, this is now two weeks yesterday from the operation. Yeah. Wow, you're kicking really well. So yeah, I'm feeling quite good. People are saying yeah. there's more color in my face and, you know, I, certainly my voice is stronger. Yeah. In two more in two more weeks, I'll be very very advanced. But they, after this first two weeks, I gotta tell you, about about five days, six days in, it was a very tough road to hoe. I really was struggling, difficulty breathing, wondering whether I'd made a colossal mistake. But I feel quite good now. One of the tests is. Uh, learning to walk again and around my, my living room. I, I've done, uh, the other day, I, I did uh, 10 times in a row, continuous four different times during the day. I began this morning doing a walk of 10 circles around the living room already, and I'll do more today. And of course, I'm getting back on the air. The whole idea was to restore my ability to continue, not, <laughs> to breathe, to speak, and to stay on the air. I told my surgeon, who's a brilliant guy, that I wanted to get back on. I was doing a dozen shows a week, and I don't think he understood how much of those show is my, you know, exploring current political events, yeah. articulating, talking. I mean, it's not just uh, my sitting passively by while others participate, but taking an active intellectual role in developing issues and analyzing events. Yeah, yeah, well done. So what are you, are you about 80? Say so get 82. 82, yeah, I thought you were 82. It's just yeah. a gift too high, yeah. Well done, so you must be the only 82 year old on talkback radio kind of. <laughs> Yeah, I may be setting the new indoor record in that category, my friend. That's great. That's great. Um, well, while you've been, well, your operation wasn't voluntary. Say again? Was it voluntary? Was your operation voluntary? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was planned months in advance. Yes, yes, yes. I had a silent heart attack back in February. Where I got up and I just, I felt so weak I couldn't even move and said to my wife, take me to the hospital. And within 15 minutes, they diagnosed that I had pneumonia and that it had affected my lung capacity and it caused my heart to beat over time to keep oxygen flowing to my body. Yeah. That it had induced a heart attack, even though I hadn't felt any pain. And it was a consequence of that that eventually led to the surgery, the double bypass. Uh, you know, but it it was months in the planning. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. So you come out well. Yeah, I feel good. That my surgeon yesterday was just ecstatic. He was ecstatic. Yeah. Good. That's brilliant. Excellent. Excellent guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I've uh, while you've been doing your stuff, I've written thirteen books. I've written a you've, whole, written, you've been writing and publishing more books? Yeah, I've written 13 new books. Um, 13? 13, wow. yeah. Here's one here, uh, Queen Anne Boleyn's Great Escape and Legacy. And she actually escaped uh, her execution in 1536 and bred again and bred a, a true royal family. Uh, so I'll just, uh, I'm, I'm going to read out the titles of the books. So there's a few things I want to get through, you know what I mean? So the book series is called British Frauds on England's, England's History. Well, Greg, you know, you, you have to be one of the <laughs> true bona fide historians of the monarchy. I mean, your knowledge of the history of the crown is, in my opinion, unparalleled. I, I, I'm in awe, my friend. Oh, cheers, cheers. Um, 
Well, because the British royal family is absolutely fake and has been for 440 years. Which is why uh, Charles really isn't entitled to sit upon the throne. And, you know, to have such a mediocrity in that position, Greg, it's just... Uh, He's got nothing. Just, just, There's nothing about him that speaks kingship. Nothing. Nothing at all. And uh, all the royalty's been, been bred out of that family for the last four yeah. years. They're, they're yeah. all illegitimate. All of them, every generation is illegitimate. And it's just a hodgepodge of financiers who have, who have bred in with the, the female monarch. Um, and, you know, often even the female was illegitimate. So yes. if we want to go back, uh, King George... Was, but was Victoria legitimate, Greg? No, no, she was Jacob Mayer Rothschild's daughter. He was the French Baron Rothschild. And her husband, Prince Albert, was the son of the stable boy, Alexander Hanstein, right? So and, which was the last legitimate monarch? Queen Elizabeth I. The first? Yeah, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. It was Queen Anne Boleyn's daughter, this one's daughter, right? Her daughter, who's also my ancestor, right? So what happened is, is Queen Anne Boleyn escaped her execution and her she lived to breed again and her grandson was Walter Raleigh and Walter Raleigh should have been the King of England. Um, and then King James VI came along. Yeah. King James VI by the dozen, the golden clown. Right? So he was... God, I love this, Greg. He was Mary Queen of Scots' son. But he died at two and a half days old in Edinburgh Castle. When they were shooting the, the cannons off to celebrate his birth, when they, shooting, when they were shooting the cannons off to celebrate his birth, the maternity room was just underneath the cannons. Right? The, the maternity room was just underneath the cannons, and the shockwaves killed the baby. So James Charles or Charles James Stewart died at two and a half days old. He was replaced by John Forbes, who was the son of the wet nurse who had a child on the same day. And then he was replaced by John Erskine, who became the second Earl of Mar. And John Erskine was the one who was crowned King James VI of Scotland, who then became King James I of England. But because he was illegitimate, because he was illegitimate and they changed his name. Um, hang on, King James VI of Scots. Uh, yeah, because he was illegitimate, um, he was crowned either James Charles or Charles James, they weren't sure. Um, and he was he was made King of Scots in um, July 1567. And then <laughs> when his father died, he had to become a second Earl of Mar. So he was replaced with all of these other James the Sixth, right? And when um, so there were, there were actually a dozen James the Sixth. One had died, and there were um, uh, another four. There's John Forbes, uh, John Erskine, and um, uh, John Erskine Sickle of Ma, and another one. Um, oh, I just can't remember his name right now. Um, so. When it came to 1603 and Queen Elizabeth died, she didn't actually, she died, but she was actually poisoned slowly, so she couldn't speak for the last two years of her life. So the fake James VI, who was actually a Jesuit servant, he killed six of the James VI in Slane's Castle, which Slane, Slane's, S-L-A-I-N, um, and then he got a bunch of Jesuits in London to announce that he was the king, and he wasn't. Ahead of him was uh, the three uh, Stanley sisters, uh, Walter Raleigh and um, Francis Bacon. And they just ignored them. And they said that when Queen Elizabeth was sick, by going like this, that she meant that James VI of Scotland, who was the Jesuit servant, was to be the, the new king of England. But it didn't mean that at all. 
Um, so James uh, Elizabeth the first was uh, buried in a ceremony, and then James the sixth actually arrived about nine days after the funeral, and just took over. And because he was never actually crowned King James the sixth of Scotland, he was um, he was never made King James of England. They changed the name of England. Well, they didn't actually change the name of England. They just used the name Britain with an extra T and an E on the end. So B-R-I-T-T-A-I-N-E. And his Lord Chancellor, Francis Bacon, pointed out that Britain had no legal basis at all. So when we had King James VI of England, colloquially, he was King James VI and King James I of England a non-existent entity called Britain. And Britain was a non-legal entity for 104 years, from 1603 to 1707, when they changed it to Great Britain. They invented the name Great Britain. And then they had a whole new royal family based on this new country that had never previously existed. <laughs> wow! Great! That's just fantastic! That is fantastic! My God! Oh no! The oh, no. Just... books have to be rewritten, Greg. I mean, you've turned up so much. Well, the other thing, Turn... is Queen Elizabeth gave Walter Raleigh North America in 1584. Really? Right. So what happened is, is, is he was given from Nova Scotia, uh, 200 leagues south and 200 leagues north, and that forms the line between the northern states of North America and the southern states of North America, and very accurately, like, you know, like with a 99.97% accuracy, and it also forms roughly the line between Canada and the Northern Territories. So by... Getting these two arbitrary countries, North America, and dividing it between the northern states of North America and the southern states of North America on a line uh, called the Walker Line, a lot of it, um, that was between within the same country. You know, who divides up their own country with a straight line like that? Um, but the line that they used for the northern southern states was the line from the 200 leagues from the southern point of Nova Scotia, which is the line that Queen Elizabeth granted to Walter Raleigh, right? Wow. So uh, Charles II, who was reigned from 1625 to 16, uh, Charles I, sorry, 1625 to 49, when he faked his execution, um, he started up an arbitrary line that was about 30 miles difference. And the United States was not divided on that line. It was divided to acknowledge Walter Raleigh as the King of England and the owner of North America. So I, I sent a 200 page document to uh, the President of the United States of America and Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles and Prince Philip and the whole royal family and the Prime Minister of the UK, Prime Minister of Israel, President of Russia, and uh, Archbishop of Canterbury and the Pope, and uh, all signed and sealed and witnessed um, that Queen Elizabeth had given North America to Walter Raleigh. And just amazing, just amazing stuff, Greg. What happened is that, and then it was handed down to me via Marquis of Pembroke, right? So um, what happened was, uh, um, where, am I? where am I up to in my story? I wasn't prepared for this story, so. so. Yeah, I love it, eh, regardless. Uh, so, so what happened was the Jesuits came along and King... James the Sixth of Scotland, who was a fake, who was King James the First of England, which was a non-existent entity, who was a fake royal, who's not royal. No one knew who his parents were. He's completely fake. Um, he was a Jesuit, a Jesuit servant, and he got the Jesuits to 
take over North America over 200 years, forming the United States of America, right? And whenever you get the word united, it's an alarm bell that it's a Jesuit takeover, right? So you've got the United States of America taking over North America. You've got the United Kingdom taking over England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. And the official name of Mexico is the United States of Mexico. Yeah. Right? So these are Jesuit Catholic controls, right? And what the Jesuits do is um, the exact opposite of what's good, right? So since I've made it um, known to um, the so-called powers that be that um, North America has been stolen by the Jesuits and called the United States of America, the United States has been breaking up, right, over the last two years. It's just disbanding. Like the whole politics is disbanding. No one knows who's the president, president of what, is it a corporation, you know, does the bar exist? Is uh, are the courts just a um, uh, a corporation registered on Dun and Bradstreet? You know, so the United States of America is breaking up, and uh, the United Kingdom's breaking up. We've got total lawlessness here. We've got a completely, utterly, and totally non-royal has just tried to make himself king, but he's failed miserably because. He doesn't have the coronation stone, and I do. I sent them a 60-page document to the same people I named before, Queen Elizabeth, Prince Charles, etc. that I've got the coronation stone. I put out a video, which is about 20 minutes long, showing that I you know, hired an eight-ton digger to dig it up, and I showed digging it up, and that it is the exact right width, length, height, and weight and it has no chisel marks on it. And out of all the many fake coronation stones and stones of destiny, uh, Leah Fowl, um, Jacob's Pillow, it's about 20 different names for it, Stone of Schoon, out of all of them, my one is the only one that does not have chisel marks on any end. So all these have chisel marks on, you know, three sides or more, you know. In other words, the others had been manufactured to conform to the specifications of the real stone, but yours being the real stone has a specification without any mani manipulation from chiseling or other forms of sculpturing. Yeah, yeah. So um, am I dark? Does my face look dark? Yeah, a bit dark. If you want to add a light, it would be good, Greg. Uh, I'll try. Uh, I just thought of it before. Never mind. I could like... use another <laughs> light; would be even better. <laughs> I'll do that. How about that? Face the window. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what's happened is that the British royal family has been shown to be entirely fake in every way. And I've got the coronation stone, um, so there can't actually be a coronation without the stone. And Prince Charles was entirely, completely, utterly, and totally aware that I had the coronation stone. And he didn't contact me. I contacted him. I sent him the letter. Well, actually, it was a 60-page document uh, with references to the video, etc. So he absolutely knew that I had the correct coronation stone. Now, Charles being from a long line of illegitimates from 440 years of illegitimacy, um, he's scared of two things, the wrath of God and the mob, right? He knows he's, he's from a long line of illegitimates. Now, um, the brief prime minister, um, Elizabeth Truss, she abdicated or stood down or announced she was going to resign after 44 days to acknowledge the 440 years that the British royal family have been legitimate, illegitimate, not legitimate. Her, uh, her resignation is related to the illegitimacy issue? Uh, yeah, it's absolutely code. Yeah, the, all, the, the, um, all the leaders of the countries have been coding for me for the last three years. I mean, quite well, right? So um, 
what happened in 1540 years ago in 1582 and 1583 is the six, the six King James VI, right, six fakes were all put in um, Ruthven Castle, which was basically a three-story stone house. And then they were kidnapped there and then they were taken to Swain's Castle. <coughs> Excuse me. And then they were uh, poisoned by their Jesuit servant, James VI. So he killed six of them. And he even wrote a poem saying that he, he killed King James VI and the devil should kill the rest. A right? poem. A poem. And he's, it's actually published. So, you know, if, if historians were actually honest with themselves, they'd read the poem by King James VI and say, here's, here's King James VI admitting to killing at least two King James VI. So there's something wrong with the history here. Yeah? And it was done in Slane's Castle, and then he basically hitchhiked or travelled 100 miles south to St Andrew's Castle. And he was just wandering around there, and the cathedral had been utterly, the Catholic cathedral had been totally destroyed um, 24 years earlier. So there's no real reason for the Catholics to be there as tourists from, from the continent, but they were. And they pointed to the Jesuit servant, uh, and said, look, there's the missing kidnapped king, James VI. And that's how he became king of Scotland. Fascinating. <laughs> and to, um, you, the, the, uh, the, the Archbishop of St Andrews was actually in prison in St Andrews Castle in the dungeons at the time that that happened. So he couldn't say, no, it isn't. Would there be a role for the Archbishop of Canterbury here, Greg, in you know, in restoring legitimacy to the crown, or no? Well, he used to he used to work in the oil industry, and there's nothing spiritual or religious about him. He's just a functionary um, standing in as the Archbishop of Canterbury to make sure that no one says anything. Is he a tool of the Windsors, basically? He's a tool of the Windsors, and the Windsors is they're not Windsors at all. They actually rent the name Windsor. The British royal family rent their own surname. Yes. They pay about five million pounds a year. The name was supposed to be Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. Right. I'll just sort of try and try and find a bit of light here. It's dazzling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on a sec. I'll just do that like that. Good. Yeah, yeah. That's better. Yeah, it was just too bright. That worked. That worked. Okay. Less, less is more. Less is more. Um, yeah, that's perfect. That's fine. Uh, so, where were we? What were we talking about? Where were we? Um, oh yeah, the, the Windsors. So, the Windsors rent the surname Windsor. They actually rent it, and they're supposed to have changed it from. Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha uh, on the 7th of July, 1917. But they were actually never Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. They were Hanstein, right? Their surname was Hanstein, and they were named after the... German, no doubt. Stable boy, Alexander Hanstein, who, when he was 14, had, had shagged Princess Louise and, and produced uh, the so-called Prince Albert, or Prince Consort Albert, but he wasn't a prince. And he wasn't a prince of Sachin, Coburg, and Gotha, which is the German pronunciation. He was just Albert of Saxony, which is like saying um, Jim of Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> it's not now of Wisconsin. No. So, um, so that was that was just a giant fraud. And then, so Prince Albert, he came over from Germany. And um, Queen Victoria was already married, right? She was already married to um, the second in line to the, the throne, blind Prince George of Cumberland. So they needed a cover for that marriage. And um, they, they, they looked for a, a lookalike, and Albert of Saxony looked exactly like blind Prince George of Cumberland because... 
Queen Victoria, Princess Victoria and Blind Prince George of Cumberland were actually lovers. You know, they were first cousins and they actually had been lovers since they were 14. Uh, so they brought on this douche called Albert from Germany and they, they gave him citizenship, but they spelled his name wrong. And then they gave him titles, uh, Saxe, Coburg and Gotha, which was just an English version of the German Saxe and Coburg and Gotha, of which he wasn't. Um, and then they, they made him a prince and then they gave him British citizenship, but they misspelled his name wrong. And then they married him to Queen Victoria and they spelled his name wrong, got his title wrong. So Queen Victoria never actually married Prince Albert. And all of the nine official children of Queen Victoria were actually illegitimate batards, darling, batards, not bastards, batards, <laughs> right? And then they married all these illegitimate children of Queen Victoria to all the European royals who really didn't want them. So they ended up marrying him to the ugliest and dumbest. And that went both ways. Uh, yeah, so we ended up with a non-royal family from from Queen Victoria, who was the daughter of the French Baron Jacob Mayer Rothschild. And Prince Albert was illegitimate. And then uh, Lionel Nathan Rothschild, um, it's actually, actually all up in this chart here. Lionel Nathan Rothschild, you can't see it though because it's a bit foggy, but Lionel Nathan Rothschild, um, had sex with, I'll try it, I'll try it. Lionel Nathan Rothschild had sex with Queen Victoria and produced the nine illegitimate children who married right through the European royal family. Um, and then uh, uh, the illegitimate, uh, so, so King Edward VII was the son of Lionel Nathan Rothschild and he um, had an illegitimate child called Winston Churchill, and he had an illegitimate daughter called Queen Elizabeth II, right? And she had um, an illegitimate son with Jacob Rothschild called Prince Charles, and she had an illegitimate son with Lord Porchester, a racing manager called Prince Andrew, and she had an illegitimate child with um, her um, secretary of the household, Lord Plunkett, and that was Prince Edward. And then Prince Charles had five illegitimate children. Five. <laughs> so first of all, he, he had um, um, he got Camilla Parker Bowles pregnant on her 18th birthday when he was 16, and that produced Simon Charles Day, who moved to Adelaide, which is consequently where Charles went to during the pregnancy. And then he married a uh, Torres Strait Island woman, which is half Papua New Guinea, half Aborigine, so she's like 100% black. And they have 10 black children. So Prince Charles and Camilla have 10 black grandchildren, which they refuse to acknowledge. And it's been all over the press. Right? Um, and um, then Charles had a uh, daughter with a, um, had a child with a, a chambermaid in um, uh, one of the castles, uh, Balmoral Castle, when she was 18. So that child is now about um, 50, 50, coming up to 55. And apparently she looks exactly like a female version of Charles. Which, uh, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> and then, then he, had a, he had another child with someone else. And then... Um, uh, Juan Carlos came along and, and sired um, Prince William with Diana, and uh, James Stewart came along and sired. Um, uh, so even even William is not Charles' son. Yeah, 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 yeah. So during the ceremony, during the so-called coronation ceremony, Charles said to William, "You are my son," right? Because he wasn't, and he wouldn't have to say that. Unless, you know, he's trying to Does make it, work? he's trying to assume that he's king and make it legal that, that William is the son, right? Um, and then there was uh, Prince Prince Henry. Uh, um, yeah. who's James Howard, yes. James Hewitt's son, James Hewitt's son, right? So Charles has nine, uh, he's five illegitimate children and he's got, um, so he's got no lineage. 
He's got no lineage forwards and he's got no lineage backwards. So what happens is that the bankers say to Charles, look, Charles, we know that you're illegitimate. Um, Queen Victoria was illegitimate. Uh, King Edward VII was illegitimate. King George V was illegitimate. Queen Elizabeth II was illegitimate. You're illegitimate and all of your children are illegitimate. So what we're going to do, if you want us to confirm your coronation, we're going to put up the interest rates by six times and we're going to put up all of the energy prices four times and we're going to do it now. Are you okay with that? And Charles goes, yep, yep, that's okay. That's fine. It doesn't cost me anything. Wow. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. In December last year, and I was walking on the side of the road. The economic rape of the United Kingdom, man, that's unbelievable. Yeah, so everyone's, you know, sort of dirt poor and and just scraping a living, and Charles is going, I'm going to be king, I'm going to be king. But he's going to be a fake king. He doesn't have a coronation stone. And also, the um, the crown's fake, the orb's fake, and the scepter's fake, and there's no coronation stone, and the bloodline's fake, and all the royals are fake. So it's a when you when you say When you say the crown is fake, Greg, do you mean it's actually... A replica, or do you mean they replace the gems, precious gems, with fake, or what? Just elaborate. Four times over, it's fake. So the 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 crown, all the royal regalia was stolen in 1216 by the Catholic Church, and then it was stolen again. It was remade, stolen again in 1450. All the royal regalia and the crown, orb, and scepter were stolen, and then. Um, it was destroyed by Oliver Cromwell between 1649 and 1658. All of the crown, orb, and scepter were stolen uh, and were taken and broken up and sold off in pieces. And in 1671, the crown, orb, and scepter were stolen again, and the, the crown was squashed flat. Um, the orb was stuffed down someone's trousers and the scepter was hacksawed in half. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's nothing legitimate about any of it, right? And they've even refused to publish that some of the true royals escape their executions. And some of the fake royals escape their executions as well, like Queen Anne Boleyn escaped her execution, um, Mary Queen of Scots escaped her execution. And I spoke to the high ups about this, and I, I said, look, look at this book here, that, uh, Queen Anne Boleyn escaped. And he goes, we know. And I said, I've got this other book, and uh, Mary Queen of Scots escaped her execution. And they go, yes, she did. No? That's I amazing. I mean, this contradicts all of history. I mean, you know, what we read in the books. Well, see, the, the value of having a totally illegitimate, bogus royal family is that it's entirely controllable to the detriment of the people. So now we've got a situation in England where the people don't know whether they're English or British. They don't know whether they're living in England, Britain, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, the EU, the Commonwealth. They have no idea who they are or where they're living or where their monarchs came from and how illegitimate they all are. It's fantastic. And basically, you're telling me that bankers are calling the shots. Totally. They're, to they're absolutely totally calling the shots on Charles. They're saying, Charles, do this. Charles, do that. So Charles is, is just doing everything he can for globalism. He's doing absolutely nothing for the people. And he's supposed to be yeah. there for the people. And he's not. Yeah. He's serving the energy companies and the banks and the globalists. And he is toxic. And he's also following bad science. While you're looking away, I'm going to grab a water. It's stinky hot in here. It's like 80 degrees. Unbelievably. It was very unprofessional of me, but. <sighs> very. <sighs> yes. Very comfortable here, but that guy's. This is just joyful, Greg. As a, a, incidentally, I just wanted to mention uh, uh, a friend of mine noticed there's a, a website when all the banishing was taking place, all the censorship. It's still pretty bad, but it's got a bit better. There's a site called 153news.net, and they published a lot of my stuff. 
and he recently discovered they have a most viewed programs and three of the most viewed programs three of the dozen are on Christ Church and the 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 leader among those three is our interview about what happened in New Zealand yours and mine right yeah good good you made such important contributions my friend well it, it's interesting though because the more you tell the truth, the more you research, the more you tell the truth, the more you are attacked, right? Yes. Because yes. AA, et cetera, and MI5, MI6, and the British Royal Family and the Rothschild, they want you to only believe what's false so they control the narrative entirely, right? So what they did is they set up a whole lot of people doing exactly what we're doing now, but telling lies and getting everything wrong. And those people have long criminal records and they are on catch and release, right? So if you say, let's say Dave Mahoney, he, he interviewed me on this King stuff and did a video and uh, he actually was so poorly researched, he couldn't answer, he couldn't ask any questions. He just didn't know what to say. So I actually did my entire spiel and then we inserted him asking questions in between because he just didn't know what he's talking about, right? Yeah. But, um, he's actually banned from North America, right? Because he was flying product in from Colombia to North America and he's banned from North America and there's only one product to fly in from Colombia, yeah? And then he was um, doing real estate frauds in Spain, selling timeshares for land in Brazil that you couldn't build on. So people were losing $100,000 at a time, 100,000 euros at a time. Um, and so he was, uh, he was completely compromised. So what he would do is he would get, he got my material. And so I did one interview with him and then he did another four or five and he just got everything wrong, absolutely everything wrong. And then they did a, so it was identity theft. And then they did a fundraiser under my name and uh, raised 1,768 euros before we spotted it and said, hey, you guys are raising funds under my name. And they, they stopped it and they kept the money. And then they had an, a forum with other criminal agents of theirs saying, oh, no, it was all legit and they didn't owe me any money. And they had a non another fundraiser for 150,000 US ready to go. I don't know what happened with that one. So... And then this guy, Dave Mahoney, his, his actual name is David George O'Mahoney. It's not Mahoney, M-A-H-O-N-E-Y. It's O apostrophe M-A-H-O-N-Y. No E's, right? So he's operating under a fake name. Yeah. So, and he's on catch and release for flying a product from Colombia to North America and banned from North America and doing real estate frauds. So he teamed up with, Charlie Ward, who's another absolute fraudster, and uh, Jack Kidd, who was running the, working with Rupert Murdoch, right? So what Rupert Murdoch does is he, he, he starts up this scam called the phone tapping scandal, right? So some of it might be real and some of it might not be, but what he does is you've got these dubious people and... Um, they want these people to infiltrate into the truth movement. So what they do is they get, they they say that they've kept their phones and they pay them, let's say, eighty thousand um, pounds as an apology for tapping their phones. But it's actually payment for these people to infiltrate the truthers, and the the truthers think, oh, they must be a good guy because they've just got to pay out for um, having their phones tapped. But the whole thing's a scam all the way through. Right, uh, and then then they get other people who, oh, most of them have false names. Like there's another one called Justiz, who's this dope smoking Muslim, and he just, you know, he's ranting and raving about me and getting absolutely everything wrong, and he gets support from another guy who calls himself M Seeker of Truth, and then he changes his name to M Seeker, and then M Truth, and then just M. Right. So he's got no friends and he's got no real name. Right. But he's getting paid by Prince Charles, who buys him a house. Right. So Prince Charles buys 
M seek of truth or M a house and all he does is slander me and get absolutely everything wrong right <laughs> um, and then he gets hold of my sister who we kicked out of the family when she was 14 for attempted murder she tried to, she's completely just she's possessed right she got a um, she got a knitting needle right? and this is this this is a story about British royal family interference on the true English royals right she got a knitting needle and she jabbed it right through her eye and went right through her pupil, right into, into her head, right? She had to go to hospital, get it pulled out. She stabbed herself with a knitting needle. Yeah, yeah, which is about eight. And she drank a bottle of glue, possessed. She's possessed, right? And um, she, when I'm 12 and she's 14, she's got a pair of dressmaking scissors in her hands, you know, the big scissors, big ones? Yeah. Big cutters, big ones, about that long. She goes to stab me, and it comes like, gets like this close, boom. And then my brother grabbed a hand and just got it, got it out of the way, right, just in time. So we, we kicked her out of the family. Um, we boarded her out when she was 14 and uh, kicked her out of the family for 10 years. And we, we sold the house, and we moved four hours' driveway and had nothing to do with her, and no one remembered her at all. She was, she was completely possessed. Like, she used to play the piano, and... Um, then she'd start making noises like some guy getting hung. Ah, you know? <laughs> and then my parents would grab her and take her to her room and hold her down, hold her jaw down. And is grab is her. she alive to this day, Gregory? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so what happened then is um, in 2000, and, so we had nothing to do with her. So she, she doesn't know us at all, right? Especially not me. I just avoid her like the plague. And then... Uh, this guy, M, who's working for Prince Charles and, and another um, MI6 agent called, uh, oh, shit. Oh, I can't remember her name right now. She's got big, bushy white hair. Um, uh, they, they start interviewing her, right? And she's the authority on me. But they don't realise that she didn't grow up with me, that we kicked her out, got rid of her. And what happened, this relates to catch and release, right? She was in South End in London, um, and she drove her car. This is about 2009. She drove her car into the pub. So it's, it's like double doors on the pub, you know, like normal normal double doors and French doors in a pub. And it's a ground-level pub. And there's people standing outside drinking, and she drives into the people and tries to she get... She drove into them? Yeah. They jumped out of the way. But she tries to get her five-foot-wide car through a four-foot-wide doorway, right? And then she flees the scene, and then she flees the country, and then she comes back six years later to England, and she's arrested and charged with reckless endangerment. Sure. Right? So she's, she, she's charged and she's probably convicted and the sentencing said, well, actually, you've got a, a brother, kind of a brother, maybe a brother, maybe not, who's an author. And um, if you talk against him and make his message um, um, reduced in some way, then you won't have to serve your sentence. That's called catch and release, Right. And there's now 150,000 catch and release in England alone. Attacking right? you? No, no, just, just attacking whoever is required. And it's called... Whoever. It's called bearing false witness. Yeah, of course. Right, so um, what, what we've got is... Uh, um, she's, she's bearing false witness against me. And Prince Charles has people like M and... and uh, Caroline Stevens, what was her name? Caroline Stevens, MI6. Um, she interviewed them as well. And, like, I haven't seen my family in four decades, right? I don't have anything to do with them because the two, the two so-called sisters, I'm not sure if they are sisters, but they're known as those lying Hallett sisters. They just make shit up in their head. They're, they're druggies, man. They're druggies. They're, they're heroin users, right? Prince Philip supplied the heroin. Same with my brother. So I just have nothing at all to do with them. And then all of a sudden, like two years ago, I'm sort of getting a lot of hits and that and becoming a little bit 
almost having my 15 minutes of fame, and they're just attacking me, making shit up, you know? They got absolutely everything wrong, everything. They said things like, oh, yeah, he abandoned his daughter. She abandoned her daughter when she was one, Man, Amanda Hallett, Amanda Pink, Mandy Hallett or Amanda Pink. She abandoned her daughter when the daughter was one and went on a drinking and drug binge for nine years and then started parenting again. Um, I spent eight years in the uh, family court and won custody. I wrote a book on the family court and uh, I ran a charity called Fathering New Zealand, helping fathers to access their children, right? So it's just utter lies, right? So what's happening is you've got the illegitimate non-royal Prince Charles hiring these catch and release absolute liars to slander anyone who's telling the truth. Sounds right. Par and for the course. Par for the course, we're seeing a lot of it. You know, I mean, you've, you've been attacked as well. You know? What can I say? Too much truth. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't like the truth because when the truth's told, everything falls down because everything's a lie. Everything, the whole lot, all of it. Government, the names of countries, judiciary, education, the history's a lie. The law's based on history and the history's a lie. So the laws are a lie, you know, and this is this is a, um, a Jesuit takeover of the world, actually. And one of the things they wanted was a totally compliant, total non-royal, extremely weak uh, Jesuit subject, which is Charles, and they wanted to crown him. Um, King of just, just, just the image of Charles and Camilla there is just so revolting. Yeah, it is, it is, it is, it's a disgrace so to disgrace that they should be in this position, Greg. I know, but what Charles is? Say again. Charles' program is to hand over the UK to the Catholic Church. That's his program. That's what he's trying to do. To the Catholic Church. Yeah. So what we're looking at is you've got the Reformation, which is when uh, under Queen Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, they took England back off the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church owned about 60% of England. Yes. Right. So now they've got Charles and they're trying to get Charles to give the United Kingdom to the Catholic Church. And they he think, doesn't he doesn't have the power to do that now, does he, Greg? Um, he doesn't have the power, but he's got the deviousness. Right. So what they had is the um, European Union piped up in, in the early 50s. And then um, uh, it was, he, it's the uh, European Economic Community. Then it became the European Union, and Queen Elizabeth signed over the UK to the European Union on the 1st of January 1973 and effectively almost gave the whole of the UK to the Catholic Church, the, to the European Union. And the European Union is a front for the Catholic Church. And the new front for the Catholic Church is the World Economic Forum. But how how has this been affected by Brexit? I mean, Charles must have been absolutely opposed to Brexit. Uh, yeah. The problem is with we're officially Brexit's a difficult term is British exit. So effectively, Britain exited, and there should have been a huge payout from the European Union to England and Scotland and Ireland and Wales. There's been no payout. So we're one foot in the European Union still and uh, one foot out. So there has not been a complete Brexit. It's, the Brexit was fraudulated. New word. Fraudulated. Yeah. So we don't know whether we're English or British and we don't know whether we're independent or not. And we have an illegitimate 
British royal family from the last 440 years. Um, and uh, they don't know the ownership. And apparently I own North America. So yay me. Is there any way to set it right? I mean, I, I would assume if you were to ascend the throne that you could do a great deal to straighten all this out. Well, I'd straighten it. I'd straighten it all out because I don't have problems with illegitimacy. Right. It's just astounding, Greg. The whole story is just boggles the mind. Well, yeah. Um, there's very few writers or researchers that look at things as big as who owns the country. And yes. Who's the royal family anyway? And yes. Why do we have so many illegitimate royals? Because all they're doing is handing over power to the foreign bankers and the Rothschilds, right? And the Rothschilds, um, they thought, um, was it 17, 1785, um, Mayor Amsterdam Rothschild had a dream that the Rothschilds would breed in with the British royal family uh, for 200 years after his death. He died in 1812, so that would take it to 2012. And uh, the Rothschilds bred Queen Victoria. They bred King Edward VII. Um, they bred uh, George V was Russian. He was the son of Tsar Alexander III of Russia. Um, and uh, Winston Churchill was a, a half Rothschild. And he bred Queen Elizabeth. So Queen Elizabeth was like uh, three eighths Rothschild. And then Jacob Rothschild was the father of Prince Charles. So Prince Charles is like um, uh, seven eighths Rothschild. He doesn't look like Prince Philip at all. Yeah. So Prince, Prince Philip ran this huge program of attacking all of the true English rules around the world with heroin. He would target heroin to those families. So Prince Prince Philip was the biggest heroin trafficker the world has ever seen. And he invented the seahorse, which was, uh, um, so you'd have, they'd dump the heroin at sea, the heroin or cocaine at sea, and then have a rope attached and a fishing line attached and a seahorse attached. And the seahorse would, would rise to the surface at let's say 10 o'clock at night and scream at a high pitched scream for 20 minutes and only people with the correct receiver could locate where it was and then they'd go and grab the seahorse, grab the line, grab the rope and grab the, the drugs. And when Prince Philip was dying in his last two years, there were like 300 kilograms of cocaine washing up on the beach and near Brighton and um, on the Norfolk coast near here, near Sandringham, and then another 60 kilograms at the next beach. And this, this was repeated because Prince Philip was too ill to monitor the seahorse. All right, so that's a pretty strong indication that he was the world's biggest heroin trafficker. Did, so he aimed, he aimed did, heroin at my family. You know, so all my three siblings were all heroin users because of Prince Philip. So that's why I don't have anything to do with them. Was and it uh, of nine too? Like he, he, they, they were getting introduced to drugs by Prince Philip's agents from the age of nine years old, and then trained as one of them was trained as a drug dealer from the age of nine. I mean, governments. These are government people training nine-year-old children to be drug dealers in Western civilization. Incredible. Was it Jim Philip who? <laughs> was it Philip? Was it Philip who directed that Diana be taken out? Uh, yeah, see, the thing about Diana is she was um, Jimmy, Gold, so Jimmy Goldsmith's daughter, right? So um, she was illegitimate, and uh, he had a long-standing affair with um, uh, Mrs. Roche, Diana's mother, um, who was Roche Pharmaceuticals. Um, so Jimmy Goldsmith faked his death six weeks before Diana, and then Diana's car crash was indubitably faked in so many ways, like taking 83 minutes for the ambulance to come and pick her up and take her back. Right. She, she survived the crash with minor 
bruising. <clears throat> well, yeah. Oh, she, Tony was dead, but Diana survived, yes. Well, she she was talking to the photographer in the car, you know. So, so yeah, Diana, Diana survived that. And um, then she could live with her billionaire uh, father, Sir Jimmy Goldsmith, you know. So I think they knew the attack was happening. She actually wrote about it in a diary. So I think that Prince Philip and Prince Charles were both involved in an unlawful killing. Well, Greg, correct me. I, the story I had, she was put in an ambulance. She was sedated. And then 100 yards or so from the hospital, she was beaten so badly in the hospital that when they arrived, it was impossible to save her life. Are you telling me she's actually alive? Yeah, they have false floors. They put a false floor in the ambulance, right? So they could get the cadaver out from underneath. It was, it's, called a, it's called a coffee run where they go around the morgues and they, they find the, the body that most resembles Diana, you know, same height, same colored eyes, et cetera, same colored skin. And uh, similar age, and so they grab the the cadaver replacement out from under the ambulance, you know, and then put Diana under the floor of the ambulance, and um, they do the autopsy on the cadaver. Diana is actually alive today. Well, there's absolutely no evidence of a death, and the the um, French coroner who they did, who they used to do the. Uh, coroner's report is um, a well-known French counterintelligence agent who is used to produce false coroner reports. Go ahead. So, so the, 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 the French coroner was well-known for producing false reports. So basically, Diana got one up on the, on the British royal family who were trying to attack her because she was actually popular. Very, you know, and study worldwide. Yeah, and and, and we just a British phenomenon. The whole world admired and loved Diana. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah she's still alive, maybe. I don't know. You know, uh, and then on the other end, you've got all of these absolute fakes. These other catch and release fakes who claim to be JFK Jr. You know, and it's some long. Yeah guy in a beanie hat with a fake name, you know, and there's, there's a couple of people claiming to be JFK Jr. There's another guy in a right. sports cap. I mean, it just lowers the tone of everything. And that's probably their role is to um, just try and destroy. Cheapen, cheapen, yeah. Cheapen everything. Cheapen you know? grief and... Uh... Yeah, so what one guy, the, the long haired guy in a beanie hat who's currently claiming to be JFK Jr., he's he's currently attacking me, you know. But what a dick. You know? So many of them are just total dicks and they're just absolute liars and the criminals are under fake names. If anyone's operating under a fake name, don't listen to them. They're just spouting bullshit, you know. If anyone's wearing a mask, they're spouting bullshit. I think you've got a, a non president who's wearing a mask. It's ridiculous, you know. It's ridiculous, Greg. You got you got people wandering around in monkey suits, and the other thing is that um, Charles, Prince of Wales, and Charles, Duke of Cornwall, are two completely different people, right? And then the Charles, Prince of Wales, maybe, or Prince Charles, who speaks at Davos, is a different person again. So. From the photograph, I, I established that there were, there were three different Prince Charles, but other people have established that there's seven different Prince Charles. So which Prince Charles was purportedly crowned on the non-coronation stone in the fake ceremony surrounded by non-royals, heavily edited by the BBC, and then the Pope supplied all of the outfits for the Archbishop of Canterbury and his six bishops, which means that the entire ceremony was clothed in Catholic. And you would only do that if you were a Jesuit. And Prince Charles is a Jesuit. Greg, just fabulous stuff, my friend. <laughs> just fabulous stuff. It's so wonderful to see you again. <laughs> I have missed you so much. Good to see you well. Good to see you well. Anyway, I've got 13 books here. 13 books I've done. 
um, 4,600 pages in total, uh, over 2,300 references and over 1,100 images. And the books are called Queen Anne Boleyn's Great Escape and Legacy, Queen Anne Boleyn's Grandson, Sir Walter Raleigh, Shakespeare, Prince King of England, Queen Anne Boleyn's Two Grandsons, Sir Walter Raleigh versus Francis Bacon, Queen Elizabeth Gives Walter Raleigh America Forever, the Lost Colony was a super capable military force. Alligator versus Crocodile, how they colonized North America. King James the Shit by the Dozen, the Golden Clown, that's 600 pages. Magna Carta frauds King John didn't know about. Magna Carta frauds of the 1600s. Magna Carta frauds of the 1700s. Magna Carta frauds King John's concession to the Pope, Charter of Liberties, and Magna Carta explained and disclaimed. Yeah, and yeah. all this, Greg, is in addition to your five volumes yeah, on the but King of England, my friend. Yeah. Wonder which I just happen to have at hand. <laughs> Keeping a door open, is it? <laughs> um, number 11, Bayou Tapestry, The Big Lie, not 1066, but 1719 to 27. Bayou Tapestry, Patterns of the Big Lie. And number 13, How to Become the Pope and Own the World. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, you know, it'd be great if you found out, when you found out the truth, that all of a sudden that would become the reality and everyone would accept that the truth was the reality. And the whole world would change because someone had revealed the truth. Well, you're doing a great job. <laughs> I would even say majestic. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like I've got the coronation stone, and it's the right length, width, height, and it's also the correct weight. And it was found in the correct location as predicted by the old maps, and it was found by the correct person because the old maps actually said first syllable H A L, second syllable L E T T, right? So they were a mile apart, Hallett, and then 1.5 miles down, 333 feet in, was the stone, and there were two branches curving like that to form a perfect circle. How do you do that? There, like that, like that, forming a perfect circle, um, three paces in front of the branch. And the water, there's a, a, a river around four sides of the field that it was in. And the field in the old map was drawn in the shape of a double bed with two pillows to show Jacob's pillow. And the damp ground beneath the field was called Larkov's water, as in, if you change the L the other way around to a J, it's Jacob's water. Um, and it was predict predicted to be found in the autumn of 2020, which is when I found it. Uh, so, and it's got no chisel marks on it. And I had to fulfill the, um, the Cinderella prophecy, right? So I bought myself a... Um, 500 pound pair of uh, church's console shoes, real shoes, very shiny. Um, and then uh, three weeks later, I went up to Scotland and, and found uh, Jacob's pillow amongst coal seams and the dirt. We did a bit of digging, just like Cinderella, you know, cinder, coal, cinder. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've got two ugly sisters who are evil, who uh, probably aren't my sisters, more like stepsisters or whatever, you know. So uh, that was part of fulfilling the Cinderella prophecy was having two ugly evil sisters who would sabotage me as much as possible, you know. Um, so um, I've got the stone. I've got the stone that makes the king, you know. So um, I've done a bit of work in this area with another person and they've been kind of acknowledged. So that's all good and, you know, more of the true royal marks are coming our way and we're just fulfilling more and more of the prophecies. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm still counting on traveling to the UK for your coronation, my friend, and staying in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> well, because I've got the coronation stone, I can actually have a coronation anytime I want. Love it. So as soon as I sat on the stone, that was it. You know, Because what you, what you do with the coronation stone, you actually sit on it. You sit on the best stone. Uh, but Charles can't handle 
the coronation stone. He's, there's no one in the British royal family that's ever seen it. It's been buried since 1296. Um, so no one's actually ever become the true king of Ireland, true king of Scotland, and true king of um, England. You know, because the stone's been missing since 1296, and we didn't have a, a the king of Scotland wasn't the king of England until 1603, and that was fate. So, you know, how, how did the stone? How did the stone disappear, Greg? Well, Edward Longshanks um, was in a war. He was king of England. He was in a war with the Scottish, and he came up and kind of conquered Scotland and grabbed the stone. But just before he grabbed the stone, they switched it and then buried the real one and marked it in the old maps of where it would be. And I got hold of the old maps and followed them, had some help from some friends. But Wow. And, and then just went there. That's an amazing story all by itself, Greg. I mean, what an amazing story all by itself. Yeah, I was working with some Scottish people and saying, oh, it could be here, could be here, could be here. And I said, oh, I think it's over here in this field here. So I went up there and they came and joined me as I'm walking around the field with my hands out, you know, finding it. And I said, I think it's here. You know, I think if we dig from this cliff face here and we dig in five metres, and that's where it was, exactly the right size. Amazing. You know, I did, I did the same thing in Portugal. I was asked, I was, I was do dropped in the middle of Lisbon and I was asked to find where uh, Prince Marcos Manuel, who's King John II of England, where he lived. And no one officially knows where he lived. And I just said, <laughs> all right, I start off with a coffee, you know, <laughs> right, I'm ready to go. And there's like um, a group of about eight overweight Jesuits all wearing the same perfume, which is kind of like a Tibetan musk. And they're all sitting there trying not to look at me, you know. So I hopped up and I go, <laughs> and I walked for about a, kilo, a kilometre and I found out where I lived. So I can, I can find stuff, you know. So is there a fake stone in, in, in Westminster Abbey? Is there a fake stone there? It's called divining, um, as in divine. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. As in the vine, as in if you're king, you should be able divining, to. Divining, yes. You know? um, so the stone in Westminster was returned to Scotland in 1996 because they knew it was a fake. And then uh -huh. um, some people in Ireland wrote to Edinburgh Castle and they said, where is the stone from that is the so-called coronation stone that you have in Edinburgh Castle? And they said, we've analysed the stone and it's from a local quarry in Edinburgh red sandstone, which means that it is not the stone from Israel and it's not the stone from Egypt, right? Because about, roughly speaking, about 500 BC, the stone came from Israel to Egypt and then to Maria the Zion. Real, the real stone. Yeah, the real stone. Yeah, um, Princess Te Tefi brought it. So she brought the stone and went to Maria Zion, which is in southwest England opposite St. Michael's Mount, and actually fell out of the boat into the sea there, so it didn't actually land in England. And then it went to Ireland. And then um, uh, three days later, uh, they went, went to Ireland to the Hill of Tara, and three days later, Princess Te Tefi was married to the King of Ireland using the Jacob's Pillow, the coronation stone, uh, Lear Fell. So uh, then in about, roughly speaking, about 580, AD, it went from Scotland to, uh, from England to Scotland for a year and then back to, uh, sorry, from Ireland to Scotland and then back a year later to Ireland again and then it went more permanently to Scotland and then I brought it from Scotland to England in 2021, June 2021. So I'm the first person to bring the Coronation Stone to England. Fabulous. Fabulous, yeah. Greg. Which is which is kind of appropriate because one of my titles is Hamashiach ben Joseph, right? So that's leader of one of the tribes of Israel. So I met with Hamashiach ben David and that, and we we're discussing this. And um, yeah, so it's only appropriate that the person who finds the stone would be one of the Hamashiachs. And yeah. Hamashiach had to be born 
on a certain day, there's a five day period where Hamashak ben Joseph could be born. And that was between the 10th and the 15th of September, 1961, uh, including all time zones. And that was when I was born, 15th September. So um, I was Hamashak, so I was allowed to do things like, I was allowed to get the coronation stone. You know? It's a wonderful story, Greg. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's all good fun, it's all good fun. So we'll chat again sometime, I suppose. Do you got anything you want to say? Just how much I'm delighted to be back in conversation with you, my friend, and uh, how much I admire your perseverance, your productivity, what you have to contribute. I think you're only on the verge of good things, my friend. Yeah, I hope so. It'd be nice if it all, you know, if, if the truth became reality, that would be a great thing. It would be a great thing for everyone. I yeah. believe. Been, I think been, so too. Yeah, we've been living lies for the last 500 years, absolute lies. There's actually no certified history prior to eight, 1834. It's all bunkum. Really? Well, you're a champion of truth, my friend, and I believe you'd be a great ruler of the United Kingdom. Good. I can only hope for that outcome. Good. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Right. Um, we'll chat again. I'll we shall, you. indeed. I'm delighted, Greg. I can't thank you enough. Good to see you well. Cheers. Wonderful.